Magazin. Hello and welcome to Global Eye. I'm Parikshit Lutra. Israel continues to pound Gaza as it steps up its offensive in Rafah. Reports have said that there have been heavy clashes between Palestinian armed groups and Israel's military in the eastern part of the city. Intense artillery shelling targeting certain neighborhoods of Gaza City have also been reported. Patients and staff are being forced out of hospitals across the area as the attacks are intensifying, leaving many sick and wounded Palestinians without any treatment. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said that they will fight with their fingernails after U.S. President Joe Biden threatened to stop supply weapons over the attacks on Rafah. However, he's hopeful Israel and U.S. can overcome their differences. Additionally, an Israeli military spokesperson said it has the weapons it needs for the mission it is planning in Gaza. Meanwhile, Israeli and Hamas delegations have left Cairo after inconclusive peace talks. Reports have said Israel has express its reservation about the proposed uh, captive release deal and has deemed this round of negotiations over. Hamas has said that they have rejected the proposal and raised objections on multiple central issues. Hamas added that the ball is now completely in Israel's court. Let me now uh, go across uh, to Nimrod Gorin, president and founder of MITWIM, an Israeli institute for regional foreign policies. Uh, he's also a senior fellow at Middle East Institute. We're also joined by Anju Gupta, security analyst and former director general of police. Thank you for being with us on the program. Uh, Nimrod Goren, let me begin by asking you, do you think this is a big break, a rupture in U.S.-Israel ties? I think it's more of an issue between Biden and Netanyahu. I think the American support for Israel is strong, has been strong since October 7th. We saw it in action when the U.S., was very important in helping Israel counter the attack by Iran about a month ago. So that uh, ironclad commitment, as President Biden said, I think is still into place. But the American administration is very frustrated from the conduct uh, of Prime Minister Netanyahu on multiple issues. It began with the humanitarian issue in Gaza, uh, with the American plans for a day after the war that Netanyahu does not share uh, on issues related to Rafah, uh, so there are many issues, especially the American wish to see some sort of a temporary, at least temporary, pause in fighting deal reached between Israel and Hamas. America has been trying to broker that for nearly four months, until now, without success. Right. Uh, so there is a frustration on the part of the Biden administration specifically, and you're saying that the overall U.S.-Israel ties remain Intact. Let me also go across to uh, Ms. Anju Gupta. Uh, Ms. Gupta, let me begin by asking you, what is the ground situation regarding the Israel-Hamas war, especially vis-a-vis -vis Rafa, and how has the war expanded, according to you? Thank you, Parikshit, for having me on the show. So the war against Hamas has entered its seventh month, and it is nowhere near the end. And what we have seen is near total devastation of Gaza, and except probably Rafa city, where the operations have also begun. We have seen, uh, you know, thousands of Palestinian civilians getting killed, many, many more getting injured, a lot of them women and children. And this has created a huge international uh, sentiment for in, you know, in aid of, in towards uh, stopping the war, but which has hadn't, which hasn't happened. And what we are seeing is that Israel has repeatedly asserted that they have already eliminated 75% of Hamas while 25% of Hamas is holed up in Rafah. They say they are governing uh, Rafah, so the Rafah operations are very necessary. But most importantly, the war, war has expanded across the region to the northern part of Israel, to the Red Sea, and also uh, targeting of U.S. bases and troops we have seen across Syria, Iraq, and Jordan, which kind of halted in the month of February with, uh, with some kind of an understanding between the U.S. and Iran. And we saw how that could also be ruptured uh, when we saw Israeli strikes on a diplomatic, Iranian diplomatic uh, building in Damascus, in which top IRGC commanders were killed. And it, it literally created a situation in which Iran and Israel could go to war directly. So what we have seen so far is that there is no end to fighting. There is no end to saying that, yes, the threat of Hamas is completely gone. 
and the war has expanded across the region. Humanitarian crisis is huge and uh, it is not known as to how long and what kind of effort would be required to actually address it. So that is where we are today, uh, nearly into the seven months of this war. Right. Uh Absolutely. Uh, clearly no end in sight and there is pressure on Netanyahu to accept a ceasefire, uh, to bring a pause to the war at this juncture. But let me go back to Nimrod Gorin. Uh, uh, Nimrod, when it comes to support, political support for Netanyahu's offensive in Rafa and Gaza, is there continued support from the political class even among critics of Netanyahu? Uh, there is an understanding of the military strategic rationale of going after the remaining Hamas units in Rafah. So it's kind of a military rationale that uh, makes sense. But this is coupled with a loss of faith in the leadership of Netanyahu and in his ability to lead Israel to achieve the war objective that it spelled out, namely the return of the Israeli hostages, eliminating the military or terror power of Hamas, and make sure, making sure that Hamas will not be the one governing Gaza anymore. Uh, because achieving these goals do not only necessitate military action, they also necessitate diplomatic wisdom. Uh, and the goal to reach that is that it must go through another type of Palestinian control in Gaza instead of Hamas, which naturally will be the Palestinian Authority in some sort of a renewed fashion with regional and international support. This is something that Netanyahu is opposes. We also know that Saudi Arabia is willing to move forward towards normalization with Israel if there is a pathway to the two-state solution, which again Netanyahu and his far right partners oppose. So all of these issues that are the openings for progress, also by the way, diffusing the tensions between Israel and Hezbollah, the northern border of Israel, is also dependent on some stopping of the fire in Gaza. So many of the objectives are being tied to issues that Netanyahu is not willing to achieve. So even if Israelis in principle see the value of going after Hamas even in Rafa, then if they look at the big picture, they do not trust Netanyahu as the one who can do that. And therefore, more than 70% of Israelis eventually are looking for early elections and for a new leadership. Right. Uh, so Netanyahu losing support. But yes, there is support for a continued offensive against the Hamas. Uh, Andrew Gupta, returning to you, uh, Netanyahu has bound to stand alone even after Biden decided to halt an arms contingent, a bomb contingent, uh, a consignment to Israel. Why does Netanyahu want to continue despite so much of criticism and despite the U.S. saying it's going to pause the bomb's consignment? See, this uh, October 7 terror attacks for Israel is, you know, they are like 9-11 to the U.S. So there is no denying of the fact that this is very big for Israel's own existence. And after that, uh, Netanyahu set three goals, very clear goals, complete destruction of Hamas and uh, uh, return of all the hostages and making sure that the, then Gaza is never used to mount such attacks on Israel ever again. Nobody is talking about the third goal as of now. But the first two goals also have not been achieved. So then nobody is saying that Hamas has been destroyed. And it is also in doubt whether this approach will ensure that Hamas is destroyed. Uh, second, uh, just about 130 or so hostages have been released. That too through mediation by Qatar. And that mediation was carried out with Hamas. So these goals have not been achieved. Uh, you know, the goals that PM Netanyahu had set. So that is one reason for carrying on with this war and not stopping. And second, I think today it's very clear that Israel, although never, never, never hidden this, sees Iran as the principal backer of Hamas and all the other militias who've now gotten together, uh, you know, posing a big threat to Israel mm. today. Something which was there always, but it hasn't come out so openly, which has really come out. And U.S. has, US has uh, treaded a very careful path of not opening a front with Iran uh, now, as of now. So there could be, and there is some talk about it, that uh, this, you know, Netanyahu would like to prolong this war until U.S. election. It's an election year. And what if a belligerent Trump returns to power? Will it be easy to get Trump to open a front with Iran directly, which is what Israel would or Netanyahu would want? 
So that could be another reason. And the third is the domestic lemma. So there have been domestic, there are domestic voices within Israel that have been asking for accountability for the failure of October 7 and also change of guard. Now, if there is a prolonged ceasefire, prolonged pause, mm. these voices are going to become louder. And that will not be very comfortable for Netanyahu and the others who have been at the helm of affairs from October 7. So I think this, these are the main reasons why the, right. you know, Netanyahu has said that they are going to go alone. Okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, Nimrod, uh, very important points there from Anju Gupta saying that uh, he wants to go alone because he knows that uh, accountability is being sought. His days are numbered and continuing, is in, continuing this war is the only way he can continue in power. But does Israel have the wherewithal to continue without U.S. support, without U.S. military and ammunition support? I think over the last year, Israel understood the importance of international partnerships, of defending its security and regional needs together with partners. It's not only the U.S. support like has been in the decades before. In recent years, Israel also managed to develop relations with Arab countries in the Middle East that helped her, by the way, uh, also defend against the Iran attack. So it's part of many lateral uh, mechanism and institution, including with India. It's part with other initiative. It's worked within the international community. It takes into account the needs of others. And that's what has been done also since the war began. We saw warnings and requests coming from the US, coming from Egypt, on issues that were vital to their interests. Generally speaking, Israel tend to uh, accommodate them. The big issue now is with Rafah, and now is definitely in a political situation in which he is benefiting or hopes to benefit within his own political base from some sort of public tension with the American president. Because Netanyahu wants to show that he is tough, that he is going all the way, that he is committed to Israel's security. That's something that Israel is mm. doubt about him at the moment. And by picking up this sort of fight with the U.S., uh, acknowledging that the U.S. is now limiting its uh, criticism only on a Rafah major operation that Israel, you know, we're not sure whether that has been started yet or not. So with all the noise about this Israel-U.S. Uh, problem, and it is a major one because the stop of uh, ammunition deliveries is something that we didn't see <laughs> happening in recent years, uh, Israel needs to make sure that it doesn't spill over beyond that, and Israel needs to agree eventually to some sort of disposing fighting to release hostages and to be able to move towards the next phases, both of its domestic transitions, but also in trying to recover from all the horrible things that happened mm. on October 7th by Hamas and after. Right. Uh, Anju Gupta, are you now seeing a different U.S. approach to the war in Gaza? You think those uh, differences of approach between U.S. and Israel will become clearer in the days to come? These differences uh, did exist even on October 7. The first reaction of President Biden was that do not act in under rage as we have acted. He was referring to 9-11 and the rage that it generated and the kind of wars that it started, most notably in Iraq and Afghanistan, which took long years to wind down. And those wars did not re yield result in terms of obliteration of uh, Al-Qaeda and others in, in, a mili in military action. So this was the first point that Biden had made very early on that let us not act under rage. And with continuing hum humanitarian crisis, with deepening humanitarian crisis, with the killing of civilians, that rage is, is not ending. So I think that is the point which, where these two leaders differ. And the un international opinion is right now correctly in favor of stopping these, uh, you know, these civilian casualties and getting in humanitarian relief and rebuilding their lives, especially women and children. So that is one point. Second point, again, very early on, as early on as October 8, when U.S. moved naval resources to Eastern Mediterranean, their commanders very clearly said that we are here to make sure that the war does not expand. So the Americans knew their assessment was absolutely correct, bang on, that the war will expand. And if it is not handled correctly, this could lead to a wider war in the Middle East, which would have been very dangerous. But the same thing has happened. The war has expanded to many countries in the sense they, they've been the, the, you know, the Hezbollah, the Houthis, the axis of resistance across 
Syria, Iraq, and Jordan. We've seen how they have come together and they have kind of expanded the threat, not just to Israel, but to the regional actors. And U.S. became the fulcrum of thwarting this expansion, also becoming a target of these attacks. And we have seen how U.S. and Iran both have calibrated their response very carefully so as not to start a direct right. war. Because U.S.-Iran war, war would have meant a big, big uh, war, wider war in the Middle East and maybe beyond that. So there have been differences between the two sides. All right. Mainly on these two issues. Right. Clearly. All right. Uh, we've completely run out of time, but I'd like to thank uh, both Nimrod Gorin and uh, Anju Gupta for joining us on the program. Uh, clearly, very complicated situation on the ground. And let's hope there is some resolution very soon. Uh, thanks once again for being with us. We're taking a short break here on the program. But up next, uh, the Palestinian ambassador to India has urged the Ministry of External Affairs in India to send critical m medicines to uh, Palestine. He says that uh, the Palestinian Health Ministry has completely run out of their stock of medicines. They have no money and urgently need help with critical medicines. That interview coming up.